Welcome back to Subbrief's Naval News. Today we'll be talking about the U.S. Coast Guard inquiry into the Ocean Gate Titan disaster that occurred in the summer of 2023. This is a still image of some of the wreckage they found near the Titanic wreck site. I'll be using the basic factual information slides provided by the U.S. Coast Guard during their Marine Board public hearing. This is the Titan submersible. There are a number of things on this submersible that I would like you to pay attention to and remember for reference further in this video. One is the forward dome that you see here. This is a titanium dome that is hinged for access to inside the submarine. It's how the crew gets in and out. It also has a viewport. There is an identical dome that's on the aft end side, but it does not have a viewport. It is completely uh, insulated and secured with no opening on the back end side, minus some communication cable and phenols that go to the equipment that is outside the pressure hall, out where the water can get to all the equipment. So you have a pressure vessel with five people inside and some computers and controllers. And then you also have equipment behind that where the Ocean Gate logo is. Now, if you look below the pressure vessel that is made of carbon fiber uh, there in the middle, You'll see what looks like a landing skiff or has landing legs on it. And on those legs and also hanging from the actual vessel itself are drop weights. Those will become important during the video. So we have titanium caps or domes on either end. We have a carbon fiber body that has five people inside. And then behind that entire structure is a free flood area that has other equipment for communication, power, um, control, things like that. And then we have landing legs with weights on them. Now, the story of the Titan uh, begins well before 2021. Ocean Gate was founded all the way back in 2009, but we wanna begin in 2021 because this is where they're now transiting to the Titanic wreck site to one, do test, and then bring on paying passengers to the Titanic wreck site. So. From June 28th to August 6th, there is a mission. Each one of these missions lasts about eight days. They try to do as many missions as the schedule will allow in the narrow window they have to visit the Titanic. They're gonna attempt 10 dives during this time. Six will be successful to getting to the depth of the Titanic. Let's begin with test one. Test one is a test dive, but it's the first one to the Titanic. So it does not have paying customers or mission specialist. It simply has uh, some people on board to control it. And I believe Stockton Rush is the only member on this dive. If he has another pilot, I couldn't find a reference for it. So we know that there's no other people on board other than Ocean Gate personnel on this dive. They do make it to the Titanic at 3,840 meters and and return to the landing and recovery uh, skiff or sled. They inspect the Titan after they surface again and they find 70 equipment uh, problems that need correction, not necessarily failures, but things that uh, need re remediating before going down again. One of which is the forward dome fell off. The watertight titanium boundary that keeps the water out fell off when it was recovered on the skiff. Now, that's not very typical, and I'd like to make this point. There are many subs going around the world all the time, and very seldom does something like this happen. I don't want people thinking subs aren't safe. Some of them are built so the front doesn't fall off. Wasn't this built so the front wouldn't fall off? Well, obviously not this one because, you know, the front fell off. It's a bit of a giveaway. Also, multiple drop weight issues were occurred during the dive, causing them to have to jettison the tray due to a malfunction. That's the entire leg assembly right there. Dropping weights for very deep submergent submersibles, you know, 4,000 meters or more is a good rule of thumb. Drop weights are a more practical way of slowing descent and, you know, losing uh, weight so that you can get positive buoyancy and help ballast the, the, uh, the submersible. But jettisoning the legs of the submersible is generally a... Um, an emergency procedure. Well, apparently, do according to this, they had to jettison the tray below the submersible body. They also had thruster failure and drop weight failure at 3,500 meters. The platform was also damaged on recovery. Now, when it says platform, 
it's not clear if it's referring to the Titan or to the landing and recovery uh, sled itself, but something was damaged upon recovery. Now, here we have the log of all the failures or problems, damage, etc., on board this submersible. Uh, and whether or not it has been corrected, closed out, and all that. Here you can see uh, the forward dome fell off on 6-30-2021. It was inspected and reinstalled. Incident report completed uh, with a resolution of yes, cases closed. And here is really the problem between doing a correction and doing a repair on something like a submersible. When your forward dome falls off, your watertight boundary is compromised. Reinstalling the dome and creating a watertight boundary again is a repair, but it doesn't correct the fault. You need to have an investigation as to why it fell off in the first place and then correct that. There's more steps than just putting the dome back on. Also down here, this is from July 3rd, some four days later, the dome hinge is found bent and they had to replace that. So the hinge that holds that over 3,000 pound titanium door on the front has had two issues in a couple days, one resulting in the dome falling off. This is a great photo of the dome in its open position. It is locked open with the bar at the top so it doesn't swing closed on you. This is your primary uh, entry. That's the only entry into the submersible for people. Uh, there you can see the hinge. That's what was found bent four days later after the dome fell off and was reattached. So there's clearly a design problem here, but they closed it out as complete and repaired and corrected when they simply reattached the dome and presumably replaced the hinge after it was bent. But here you can see the multiple screws that hold the dome together to this titanium ring. This titanium ring is uh, fused with the dome right here. Again, there's one of these domes on the aft end of the submersible. Okay, now we're going to go to 2023. This is the year of the disaster, okay? Now, according to witnesses, uh, there was less support vessels available and uh, costs were very high because of that. Uh, so they couldn't get the same support vessel that they had before. They had to go with the Polar Prince, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with using this support vessel, but it doesn't have the same facilities on board. Instead of carrying the launch and recovery sled with the Titan on it on board the ship itself with the ability to launch it into the water and recover it, this ship, the Polar Prince, does not have that launch. So it has to tow it like you see here in this photo, which is fine. You just have to watch your weather and sea state conditions as you tow it. But that's how they're operating now. It's a new support ship towing the launch and recovery skiff to the wreck site in 2023. They're going to do four missions. Missions one through four begin in May as early as they can uh, to get as many missions in as possible because they're going to have some paying customers eventually. Now, mission one, because it's a new support vessel, is an orientation mission only. There are no mission specialists. There are no guests. There are no paying ticket holders on this mission. It's eight days, May 11th to May 19th. Two days transit to the wreck site, four days over the Titanic wreck, two days back. That is going to be the general schedule all summer. Mission one of as many as they can get in while they have this contract with a support vessel. So during this mission, all they do is training, walkthroughs, and orientate everyone with the procedures of how they're going to conduct these operations. They return to port, and on May 20th, they go on mission two. This one does have some mission specialists, and they're going to actually make dives now. So on May 22nd, they're conducting an unmanned dive. This is dive 84 technically, but it's just to eight meters. And the idea here is to submerge it and make sure that it works, there are no problems, and surface it, surface it again. On May 24th, just a couple days later, there is a storm with high sea state. And in the morning, they look out behind the ship on the tow line and they see this. The Lars platform is partially sunk 
presumably due to loss of variable ballast or some sort of damage. It's not clear, but there is damage to the Lars platform and it is still neutrally or slightly positively buoyant holding up part of the Titan. They're very lucky they didn't lose the whole thing right there. So on May 27th, after they've done some repairs to everything, the Lars and the Titan, they conduct a post-incident test dive and they record that there are still 13 equipment issues requiring correction. They return to port. Mission two is over. Mission three starts the very next day. They don't take any time in port to repair anything. Everything is being done with the assistance of the support ship, uh, with the Lars in tow. Um, so on May 29th, they proceed out and do more checks after that May 24th incident. They complete a dive on May 30th, and for whatever reason, there is no log of this dive. So on May 31st, they complete dive 85, again to just 10 meters. They're submerging the launch and recovery skiff under the water. They're taking the Titan that's bolted to it, unbolting it. It's getting off the platform. It's swimming around, uh, diving to about 33 feet, 35 feet, and then coming back to the skiff, doing launch and recovery operations to make sure that they can do that uh, correctly and safely. On June 5th, the next, um, a couple days later, they do complete dive 86 with three mission specialists on board. So despite all these incidents and equipment failures and corrections, they now have people on board and they're going down to the Titanic. Now, mission four um, is another eight day period coming up with no breaks. They go back to port, they come back for mission four on June 7th. June 7th, um, they have to alter the plan because there's bad weather over the Titanic uh, site. So they instead transit uh, northwest of the site. So they're not over the Titanic at all for this eight day period where they do conduct dive 87. 87, uh, the Titanic experiences uh, partial failure of the variable ballast system. Variable ballast is very important because the Titan submersible uh, uses that system to keep itself level. Without that, you could have a, a, a angle down, an angle up. You could be listed 90 degrees left or right. You know, you need your variable balance to keep yourself s steady and straight. So that system partially fails and the Titan is stuck in a 45 degree up angle and it's not attached to the launch and recovery skiff, but it has to come in and land on it like that. And it takes them about an hour to land on the skiff divers in the water, bolting the thing down, trying to raise the platform positively so that the, the Titan, you know, gets flat and they can mechanically attach it so it's safely secured as the sea state is knocking it around for about an hour. So the people inside and all the equipment are being jostled around for about an hour as this is going on. But we got a mission to do, boys. So they go back to port, drop those people off, um, conduct inspections, presumably, even though it's not stated clearly. And mission five begins. Mission five is the one where the tragedy happens. Now the Polar Prince to review here has 17 crew on board, including the captain. The captain's often called the master. That's just a nautical term. I'll be calling him the captain for ease and communication here. There are 24 clients of the Polar Prince from Ocean Gate that include four mission specialists, to presume that those are the paying customers, and two mission specialist companions. Was not aware that they could bring guests, but apparently there's a plus one policy in the Ocean Gate Titan experience. So according to the Polar Prince deck log, uh, after departing, they would tow the, the skiff, the Lars, you know, about 250 meters astern, and then once they got out to sea, they would extend that uh, a little bit farther back. During the transit, so it's June 17th, the day after they leave port, they're coming, the next day is going to be the day on site. Uh, they conduct training with all hands. They go over the dive procedure, and they have lunch and dinner together between these training sessions. So everyone uh, from the mission side, the mission specialist side, is getting acquainted with emergency procedures and how to get in and out of the submarine and what to expect during the whole experience. Now, 
The day of the mission, uh, June 18th, begins very early. You know, 0500, everyone's up, they're getting dressed, ready to go. But we're going to begin at the time of the actual dive, which is 9 a.m., 9.14 a.m. in the morning, when the polar prints, according to the deck log of the support ship, uh, the Titan disengages from the submerged Lars platform, which is right below the surface, and it begins to proceed with five people on board down to the wreck site. About four minutes later, there is a text communication, which is the primary means of communication between uh, the team, the Ocean Gate team on board the support vessel and the Titan. And it's a communication check, which is just the letter K. The Titan responds with letter K. So everything so far is going fine in terms of communication. There are three modems on board, I should point out at this point. These acoustic modems provide data between the two vessels. So... One is text communication. Another, the other two are like positioning communication. One is a pinger, uh, which makes a literal ping, and that gives location, bearing, range, depth data to the surface vessel. And you can also do that both ways. When you ping, both vessels will see where they are relative to each other. And there's also a third one. Um, so three acoustic uh, modems are communicating between the two two vessels. So. Communications continue uh, with some interruptions, but no real uh, abort problems or there's no failures requiring an abort until 1047, some 90 minutes or so later, when they get a text on the surface from the Titan that says dropped two weights. So drop two weights at that type of depth with this type of submersible could be part of the procedure where to slow their descent before they hit the bottom, they drop a little bit of weight to slow them down. That could be what this is. Or it could be that they have a problem some 300 meters above the Titan or Titanic wreck site and they don't even see the bottom yet and they're trying to lose weight right now for some reason. It's not clear because we don't have the actual dive procedures to review uh, dropping these two weights 90 minutes into the dive if this is normal or not. Some six seconds later, that pinger I told you about, completely lost. So now they have no communication with the Titan at all as of 1047 a.m. local time with the Titan. Now, I would like to review what that looks like with the actual text log. This is again provided by the US Coast Guard. The inquiry hearing at the top, we have the support vessel, Polar Prince. Uh, the green line with a little white dot is the submersible going down to the Titanic behind me here. Now, here we can see that the text messaging doesn't have any kind of autocorrect whatsoever. It says, Polar Prince, PP, I have tracking, but they misspell it, it's fine. Uh, Titan says, dis descending through 235. They mean 235 meters, and PP responds again with the correct spelling, I have tracking. So everything is working right now. Three acoustic modems working, text chat is working, uh, Titan says yay, and then the AA means acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. Both people, both positions are acknowledging all the systems are working right now through 242 meters. Now, at 9.25 a.m., descending through 461 meters, we're getting deeper and deeper here, uh, Titan says, no ATM, are you on? That's an acoustic modem. That's a positioning uh, device, a communication device. Uh, Polar Prints texts back, the acoustic modem, the ATM, is on. So... Uh, PP says, uh, do not read you on my ATM either. Titan simply acknowledges that. They just acknowledge that their positioning, one of their three modems that communicates position, uh, has, has had some sort of failure. It doesn't work at the moment. Could be conditions. They might have descended through a very strong acoustic layer would be a very realistic possibility here. They do expect one of the three modems to not have the range to communicate after a depth of 1,000 meters, but they're not even halfway there yet, and they've lost one of the three. Probably the one that they expected to lose communication with around 1,000 has lost it much earlier. That tells me that this was a strong acoustic layer environment or a mechanical failure of the component itself. This is problematic for the next 35 to 40 minutes as they descend 
to the Titanic, the Polar Prince repeatedly asks, do you see Polar Prince on the display? And there is no response at all. This should be considered a loss of communication. However, they continue to ask the question uh, via text as the Titan continues descent. Keep in mind, there's still a pinger on board and they can see the descent of the Titan as this is going on. So they've lost one positioning acoustic modem. They've lost the ability to talk via text and they now have a pinger that they're just listening to descend towards the Titanic for over half an hour now. Finally, they get a response. Uh, Por uh, Polar Prince says, I need better comms from you. You know, respond to our text if you can. Titan says yes, as in of course. But then they explain, we've lost system and chat settings. So we don't know exactly what that means. Um, did they lose, did they have to reboot their PC and wait for it to reboot and then come back online for acoustic chat? We don't know. I'm purely speculating there. Finally, Titan says, this is PH, that's Paul Henry, an absolute legend in deep diving submersible community. He is um, a very experienced submariner and he's on board now and he's in charge of the communication. Presumably it was not pH before because he identified himself now at 2200 meters in depth after a, an acoustic communication failure for some 30 minutes. So polar prints text acknowledge status question mark. Do you see polar prints on your display? So you know your orientation to the support vessel on the on the surface. The only answer is he repeats this is pH. This is Paul Henry, as if he didn't even see the question. So communications appear to be intermittent at best at a depth of 2,200 meters with all with one acoustic, one one acoustic uh, communication failure already. Uh, all they have really is the pinger at this point. Finally, some 90 minutes into the dive total at a depth of 3,346 meters, uh, they drop two weights, and that's what they say uh, via text. Uh, the pressure is now at 4,900 psi. And that's where they lose communication. Uh, some six seconds later, they lose the pinger. The very last uh, form of acoustic modem communication is completely lost uh, some six seconds later. So they go into uh, loss of communication procedures. At uh, 1115, they inform the captain of the Polar Prince that they lost communication at 1049 and, uh, and 50 seconds. And so now they're breaking out the manuals. They're seeing what they're going to do. They're assuming that Titan will perform uh, loss of communication aboard of mission and begin ascending back to the surface at a rate of about two meters per second. If they begin this operation now, they will be at the surface around 3 p.m. local time. Their scheduled surface for a full dive with no problems is 6 p.m. There's a three hour window there that they're not exactly sure what Titan's going to do because they have the customers on board. So finally, Titan doesn't surface um, at, at 3 p.m. So according to their procedure, Ocean Gates procedure, they use the polar prints to begin a grid search pattern around the expected surface position point to begin looking for a surfaced or partially surfaced Titan till 6 p.m. They do not find it. So at 627, they have a meeting with the captain of the Polar Prince support vessel in his cabin and say, you know, we've lost communication with the Titan. Uh, recommend that we go into a search and rescue with the U.S. Coast Guard or the Canadian Coast Guard. One of the Ocean Gate staff says that they've used the satellite phone to call Halifax, Canadian Coast Guard, for search and rescue procedures and let's commence finding these people. They were redirected to the Boston United States Coast Guard office uh, for that because the Boston US Coast Guard office is responsible for search and rescue over the Titanic site. So at 7.10 PM, the Ocean Gates crew um, goes through their procedures and they contact the Canadian Coast Guard because they're uh, operating out of Nova Scotia, but the Halifax office is where the Canadian Coast Guard is out of. And they tell them to contact the Boston U.S. Coast Guard Center. And at 710, the U.S. Coast Guard begins to get involved with phase four distress operations. Luckily, they were able to get a, another ship on site within a few days that had deep submergence remote 
operating ve vehicle or ROV Vs on board that can get down to the Titanic's depth. And they begin searching for a stranded submersible or wreckage. And this is what that ROV finds. They find what appears to be the forward dome, the forward titanium dome laying on the ocean floor near the Titanic just by itself, nothing else with it, just a partial, but there's been a clear breach of watertight integrity at this point. They don't have to look far though to find the end cap. This is the free flood area that's outside the pressure vessel itself, just aft of where the five people would sit in the center of that carbon fiber tube. This was apparently detached at some point and is sitting, you know, nose down uh, with the rear end sticking up out of the sand there. You can see the components and the amphenols uh, completely just ripped off. And finally, this is the rest of the Titan. This is the actual carbon fiber pressure vessel. You can see the aft dome uh, there with the carbon fiber compressed, shattered, if you will, and pushed uh, into it. The white part that's up there, that's part of a fairing that was over top of that carbon fiber. Uh, you can see that that's been completely pushed in. It would normally be uh, bowed out, but it's now concave, uh, pushed in against itself. Now, there's a few things here that I would like to show you. All right, so like I said, this photo can tell us a lot. So I'm gonna uh, point your direction to here. Here we can see the white fairings uh, that were on the outside of the pressure hall. They appear to be collapsed in. This, this section here appears to be slightly curved, a little bit like that. So it was pushed in and basically squished the carbon fiber towards the front of the vessel in this case. That doesn't mean it began there, it just means that's, that's how it ended there. That's how it is now. So what we don't see in this picture is the forward dome, which would be right here and go out that way. So with that dome being missing, it is implied that it was pushed off. The boundary was broken between the carbon fiber itself, which was attached by a very strong epoxy and the titanium ring. The amount of pressure it would take to dislodge that bond, that seal is immense, but that's the pressures that we are working with in, in this depth here. So down here, let's move aft. It is clear that the pressure vessel after it imploded was moved rearward. This is the indication that the failure of containment uh, began forward in the forward half at least of, of the pressure vessel. And this is just my observation from this still. Um, obviously if I had more data, we could go into more detail about this, but it just appears that it failed and was pushed back and why I think it was pushed back and not just, um, fall back on its own by gravity or whatever is we have very clear evidence right here. Look at this seal. This is the aft dome that's made out of titanium. And this right here, the, this is the ring that it is attached to. And that ring is then epoxied to the carbon fiber pressure vessel. Here we can see such force was used to detach the dome from the ring that it damaged part of the titanium right here. Look at this, right in that area. That's where you can see a lot of the damage uh, where the ring was physically ripped from the aft dome. That is a lot of energy doing that. Now, down here, we can see the aft dome is this section right here. Again, it doesn't have a viewport window on it. That does not appear to have played any role in this. I just want you to know that this is a solid piece of metal being ripped off another titanium ring. And the force that did that appears to be the body, the entire body of the carbon fiber is shattered and compressed with such force that it ripped apart titanium bonds. This was a violent implosion. It, this would have happened in, you know, microseconds, much faster than the human brain can perceive anything. So it is very unlikely that any of the occupants on board had any idea 
that this was going to happen before it actually happened. Whether or not there was other problems like the communication failure we saw or additional things we don't see uh, causing them to drop weights some 300 meters above the surface, um, we'll never really know because the people who know that are still inside this area. When this was recovered, there was a substance paste-like that uh, when tested did have the DNA of the five recipients, five recipients of the five passengers on board the Titan. And uh, these sadly are the five people on board, the five people we lost in 2023. We have Hamish Harding right over my head here. We have Shahazada Daywood and his 19 year old son, Suleiman Daywood. We have Paul Henry, a famous submariner, um, absolute, you know, legend in submersibles and deep water exploration. And then finally, Stockton Rush, who was uh, on board, uh, one of the founders of Ocean Gate and operator of the, uh, of the submersible. And uh, just recently, the U.S. Coast Guard has released this video here of some of the recovery operations of the ROVs that went down to recover the domes. This is the forward titanium dome that you just saw in the previous photo. Uh, they just released this uh, image or video for us. Thought you might like to see it. Uh, this is what it's like to pick something up off the ocean floor some you know, thousands of meters down. It's not easy to do. Something that strikes me is if you look at the construction quality of just the arms involved of this remote operated vehicle, they are, you know, I, in my opinion, apparently much better constructed than anything I saw in the photos that I have of the Titan. And it really shows you the difference between something that's uh, professionally built and rated versus an unrated submersible uh, that ended up costing lives of five people. And uh, if any more comes out of this hearing that is in process, we'll do a follow-up video. Otherwise, this will be it. So uh, I would just like to say at the end here that uh, the Titanic is not a tourist site. It's a wreck site. It's a graveyard. They should leave it alone. And so as is now the, uh, the Titan wreckage or anything that's left down there is a, uh, is a grave site. It is not to be visited by tourists. Thanks for watching.